So section 3.4, we're just going to discuss the rational root theorem and try and put together a few things that we've been doing with our polynomials to try and factor them and solve for where they cross the x-axis, find the roots or x-intercepts. And the thing that I want to introduce here is something called the rational root theorem. Now, if you're looking at a polynomial and trying to figure out where it crosses the x-axis, especially a bunch of years ago before we had a graphing calculator, it's helpful to have some places to start guessing. I mean, you can have a good guess here at 0 0.4. Can anyone think of the fraction that that represents? What's 0 0.4 as a fraction? Two-fifths. Two Thank you, Andrew. So two-fifths here. But these are a little harder to guess. It's like, well, I really don't know. Now, if you have something like Desmos or your graphing calculator, you can certainly come up with better guesses. But as far as guessing at it is concerned, if your polynomial is going to cross the x-axis at some place rational, then it's going to happen at a particular set of candidates. Now, before I discuss exactly what those candidates are, let me discuss what they are not. And they are not irrational numbers. Where would you get an irrational number? Well, here's a little heads up for your exam. Suppose I had x squared minus 7 equals 0, and I wanted to solve that one. Now, a lot of us would probably move the 7 to the right-hand side and get uh, x squared equals 7. That's fine. But let me remind you that when I have a squared minus b squared equals 0, that one of the things I can do is factor this as the difference of squares. So a minus b times a plus b. And what's the relevance here? What's the relevance for, I don't know, maybe a problem on your take-home? You can factor this if you wanted to. You could factor it as, well, x. And what do you square to get 7? Square root of 7. So you get x minus the square root of 7 and x plus the square root of 7. So you get the same two solutions, x is the square root of 7 or x equals negative root 7. You get the same two solutions that you would have gotten had you moved this to the other side and used the square root property. Either way, it's fine. My point to you is that you can factor these kinds of things by using a radical. And I also want to mention what these are not. These are not rational numbers. If you look at this on your calculator, these are numbers that never end and never repeat. So square root of 7, square root of 2, square root of 3, never end and never repeat. So they're irrational. Rational numbers are things that can be written as a ratio of two integers. So something over itself. Kind of a design that I thought would be, or something kind of cool that I thought would be on uh, a t-shirt for like the math club would be square root of 2 is not equal to a over b. And basically what that's saying is that it's not a rational number. You can't write it as a fraction. Back to this. What are the possible fractions that would solve this equal to zero? In other words, the x-intercepts. Well, there's a bunch of candidates. And because this example is kind of long, that's why I did it out on your handout, you're going to regard this number here as being p, and this one, or its factors, is being q. So let's take a look at all the possible factors of those two. So that's down here. 6, or any of its factors, I mean p is one of these values. q has a lot more possibilities. So there's 4 possibilities here times 8 possibilities here. If your polynomial is going to cross the x-axis, at a rational root, it has to be something of the form plus or minus p over q. So how do I come up with this list then? Well, just one at a time, I grab some values and start working through. So I'll take a value of p, say p equal 1, over a value of q. So 1 over 1 is 1, and then 1 over 3, and then 1 over 5 and 1 over 7, and so on. And so I get these eight different numbers. 
And then I cycle back to 2. 2 over 1. 2 over 3. 2 over 5, etc. And so we get all these candidates. I want to point out something about this process, though. You're going to get things kind of twice. Right? I mean, not all of these are going to be unique. For instance, 6 over 3. Well, I already got that. That's 2, right? What else do I have that's kind of redundant? 3 over 3. 3 over 3 is 1. I already got that one. And so on. So you can get rid of a bunch of these that are repeats. Um, 6 over 21 is really 2 over 7. So, again, you've already got that one. That one's redundant as well. And so on. And if you get rid of all these redundancies, you get a list that looks like this. So I've written them in order, in increasing size, from smallest to largest, and there's still that plus or minus. So, yay. If your graph's going to cross the x-axis at a nice rational root, it's going to be one of these. In fact, uh, very helpfully, we notice that one of our roots, two-fifths, is already on that list. Good. So, what would be some other ones? Well, you can guess at some of the other roots. Um, now, based on these, I'd probably want to guess something negative. But if you didn't have a nice graph to work with, you could guess something like a positive value, positive, say, 3 sevenths. And this is just kind of a little bonus here for us. I'm not really going to ask this type of question from you. But if I'm thinking that 3 sevenths is a root, I should check it by synthetic division. So it'd be 105, 38, negative 17, and negative 6. If this is a root, then what should this number be here when I get all the way down to the end? should be 0. Now, synthetic division starts out with a 0. And you add going down. 100 and 0 gives me 105, or 105 and 0 gives me 105. Multiply gives me 45. And then add gives me 83. And here's where it gets sticky. Um, and just copy down the numbers if you want to. You'll end up with 34 and 4 sevenths. And then 18 and 4 sevenths. 7 and 47 over 49. And finally, 1 and 47 over 49. So obviously we missed our target. We didn't get a 0 here. But the benefit, though, of doing it this way is that we did find out that whatever the roots are, this is bigger than the roots. In other words, this is an upper bound. Your root has to be less than that. So you can kind of draw a little line in the sand. You don't have to check anything to the right of 3 sevenths because all these are positive, making that an upper bound. All right, that's a little bit of an extra bonus. If this was a usual semester, then there might be a bonus question on upper bound and lower bound. A lower bound would be something like negative 2 thirds. But the thing for lower bounds is that I don't want all these to be positive. I want them to alternate sign. So 2 thirds doesn't work out any easier than 3 sevenths. That's why I'm not going to go through it. Let's get back to the problem, though. We know that 2 fifths is a root. What else looks like it could be a root? Well, something near a negative 2 fifths. Mm-hmm. So take a look at our choices here. Something near negative two fifths. I got a couple of values that present themselves negative one third and negative three fifths and negative three sevenths. So which one's the right one? Let's take a look at Desmos. I think this one is graphed. You can certainly do this on your graphing calculator. 
There's one of them. There's one. And, yeah, the question is, well, what's that one? Well, let's get back to it. Let's get at it a different way. So let me share with you what we can do on that one to find that root. So let's come back here. I know that two-fifths is a root, so let's take care of that. Two-fifths, and then 105, 38, negative 17, and negative 6. Synthetic division always starts out with a zero here, so we'll do that. We get 105 times two fifths, so that's 105 times 0.4 gives me 42, and that gives me 80, and that'll be what 32 and 15, and two fifths of that is six. Yay! Looking good. What that's telling me about my polynomial is that p of x can be written as some binomial times what? What's this polynomial here? 105x squared plus 80x plus 15. But what's this term out in front? x minus two-fifths. Good. Now, if you notice, I can factor something out of this, right? What is it that I can factor out of this part right here? Is there a number that factors out of all three of these? Yeah, a five. And that leaves behind 21x squared plus 16x plus three. Yay. If you want to, you can distribute that 5 to this term here and make it 5x minus 2. I really don't have much preference for it one way or another. I guess it's nice that you have it this way because you can just look at that and read off what your root is, right? Your root is at 2 fifths. So that's nice. But on the other hand, uh, this looks nice, too, because it's just odd to have those fractions there. This is probably what you would see in the book. The question is, how does this factor? Now, if you're like me, I hated factoring these things. What makes it difficult? How come this factorization is more difficult than, say, if I just had an x squared? Yeah, yeah because this is something different than 1, then it's a lot more work to factor this. So, I got an idea. Let's look back at our polynomial and see if we can't figure things out. Now, clearly, it looks like negative one-third is a root. So, if negative one-third is a root, let's kind of do a little reverse engineering. So, I've got a root at x equals negative one-third. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and create a binomial factor that has that root. So I'll multiply both sides of this equation by 3. And that gives me 3x equals negative 1. And now move that negative 1 to the left-hand side. And when it changes sides, what else changes? Changes signs. So now you've got 3x plus 1 equals 0. So this is a linear factor that has a root at negative 1 third. Hmm. Let me see if I can't use that to help me factor. So we're going to focus in on this part right here. That term out in front, hey, we're already good with that. We know where this is 0. That's 0 at 2 fifths. But it looks like one of the factors is 3x plus 1. Kind of get that one for free almost, right? 
Now, if this is 3x plus 1, I can figure out what this factor is. Because the first two of these terms have to multiply to what? 21x squared. So that would be a 7x. The last two terms have to multiply to 3 plus 3. So cool. Now it's completely factored. And you can see where the roots are. We have roots at x equal 2 fifths, x equal negative 1 third. What's the root here? Negative 3 sevenths. And let's get a decimal value for that. Negative 3 divided by 7, negative 0.4285, etc. Let's kind of compare that to what we see up here. Cool. And just getting a rounded version of that number. So it matches pretty nicely. All right, so you've got this thing completely factored, and you know where its roots are. That's pretty much all I would ask on a problem like that, is find the roots and or factor it. This is a product of linear factors. Should I do a summary of this? Want to do a recap? No, we're good on that one? George? Please do a recap. All right. So we started out by finding the possible rational roots. The possible rational roots come from a ratio of the factors of this to the factors of this. So P over Q. So here was my P's and Q's. Uh, P was any of the factors of 6. Q was any of the factors of 105. If you list out those factors and look at those possible ratios, you get quite a list. So if the graph is going to cross the x-axis at a rational root, it's going to be one of these. Now, if you get rid of the redundant ones, you pare down your list to this. And in looking at things, we saw that, okay, well, it looks like two-fifths is one of the possible rational roots. And when we checked it by synthetic division, it was a rational root. So we said, okay, that's a rational root. I did it by synthetic division. So that means I can rewrite my polynomial as a product of this factor and this quadratic. This had a GCF of a 5. I pulled that out, leaving this. I distributed the 5 here, and I said, you know what? It'd be nice if I factored this. So we did that. To factor this, I kind of cheated a little bit. I said, you know what? If I know what one of the roots are, then I can figure out one of the factors. Since it seemed like I had a root at negative one-third, I turn that into a binomial factor. This binomial has a solution at x equal negative one-third. So if that was one of the factors, we reverse engineered this factor. We said, all right, the first two have to multiply to 21x squared. So if this is a 3x, that has to be a, a 7x. And likewise, since the last two have to multiply to a 3, a 1 here has to go with a 3 there. That gave me my factorization and my last root. Cool. Courtney, I hope this is bringing some of those things together for you as well. All right. Let's try some more. Problem number 40. P of x is 6x to the 4th minus 7x cubed minus 12x squared plus 3x plus 2. And I think I've gone over this before in terms of my notation for a viewing window. Negative 3 to 3 by negative 20 to 20. That would be a good viewing window. Let's actually graph this one on our graphing calculators. So let me plug that in here. 
6x to the 4th minus 7x cubed. Oops. Something, something happened in that first term. 6x to the 4th minus 7x cubed minus 12x squared plus 3x plus 2. Okay. Let's set up our window. This one I want to graph between negative 3 and 3 on the x-axis and negative 20 to 20 on the y-axis. Might want to make y scale something other than 1. That way you don't have a gazillion tick marks up and down the y-axis. When you're ready, hit the graph key. Let's take a look at this graph. So we expect two things that eventually both go up. That is the tails, and it doesn't disappoint. It looks like we've got one, two, three, four different possible rational roots. So let's first decide what they might be by applying the rational root theorem. So that's going to be your P. That's going to be your Q. P is going to come from the set of factors of 2. So that's a mercifully short list, especially compared to our last problem. And likewise with Q. Q is one of the factors of 6. What are the different factors of 6? 1, 2, 3, and 6. Good. You need to list all of them. So 1, 2, 3, and 6. Our possible rational roots, and this is a question on your little exam that you're going to be working on for me. Our possible rational roots are plus or minus, and please don't forget the plus or minus, P over Q. So just go through one at a time and do 1 over 1, and then 1 over 2, and then 1 over 3, and then 1 over 6, and then keep going. 2 over 1. 2 over 2, 2 over 3, and 2 over 6. And that's it. Those are all the different combinations. But a couple of these are redundant. A couple of these are listed twice. Which ones do you see that are listed twice? 2 over 2, I can get rid of. And 2 over 6, that's one third. I can get rid of that one as well. So, all right, getting rid of the redundant ones, plus or minus P over Q, and I'll try and write these in increasing order. Let's see, it'd be one-sixth, one-third, one-half, no, 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 uh, yeah, one-half, two-thirds, one, and two. So if your graph is going to cross the x-axis at a rational number, it's going to be one of these. And let me put the plus or minus out here as well. Well, let's try a couple of them. Let's try it and see if they work out. And personally, I'm going to go for the easy ones first. It looks like the graph crosses the x-axis at 2. If it crosses the x-axis at 2, when I do a trace of 2, so to hit the trace key, trace, and then type in a 2, what should my y-coordinate be if it's an actual x-intercept? 0, thank you. So 2 and 0, so okay, that's that works. And then it looks like negative 1 works as well. So okay, we got a couple of them. Let's work on those by synthetic division. I eventually want to have this completely factored and find all the roots and write it as a, fact, a product of linear factors. So we'll start out with the easy ones. Like I said, the easy one would be like a negative 1 or a positive 2. So I'll start out with a positive 2. Six, negative seven, 
negative 12, 3, and 2. What goes underneath the 6 to begin with? 0. Thank you. So a big goose egg there. And then also do yourself a favor. Draw a little line here for that last one because that last one's going to be your remainder. Now if 2 is a root, then what should this remainder be? It should be 0 as well. So let's see. Uh, 6, uh, 12, 5, 10, negative 2, negative 4, negative 1, negative 2, bingo, 0. So that's cool. That's what we expected. Now, let's take this and keep going because there's another factor that we know results in a root. Um, in fact, we know the root is at negative 1. So let's put in a negative 1 here and work with this reduced polynomial. 6, 5, negative 2, negative 1. Add going down. Of course, it starts with a 0. Got to get that 0 in there. So 6, negative 6, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, and 0. Yay. Wow, that's really cool. Because what this has told us is that I can rewrite my polynomial. And let's see what I can do here. My original polynomial looked like this. But now I'm going to kind of decompose it into linear factors. So let's see here. What linear factor goes with a root at 2? x minus 2. Good. And how about the root at negative 1? x plus 1. And over here, this represents 6x squared minus x minus 1. Now, again, we're going to need to factor this thing. Boy, if you like, like I said, if you're like me, you're not really good at factoring these things. But let's take advantage of the fact that we've got the graph, right? So the fact that we've got the graph means we can try some of these rational roots. In fact, you can kind of cursor over and take a guess at 1. Looks like we're getting close to 1 at negative 1 third. Let's try. Hit the trace key. Trace, negative 1 divided by 3, and we get a 0. So negative 1 third is a root. Let's see where the other one is. Where's the other root look like it's at? Wow, nailed that one. Usually don't trace to it. Usually your window isn't perfectly set up so that you can trace to it, but this one we got lucky. So we got a root at negative one-third and positive one-half. So x equals negative one-third and x equals one-half. Now we've already worked on this one today. The root at negative one-third corresponded to what binomial? Yeah, 3x plus 1. Thank you. 3x plus 1. Work with this one. See if you can't figure out where that root corresponds to, or what binomial that corresponds to. Remember, you're going to multiply to get rid of the fraction, and then you're going to move everything to the left-hand side. Yes. I'll give you a chance to work on it real quick. See if you can't find that binomial term. Okay, so the trick is to move that to the other side. You get, I see, actually, we probably multiply both sides by two first. 2x equals 1, and then move that to the other side. Our binomial is 2x minus 1.
that finishes off our factorization. So that term there can be broken up. Let me zoom out a little bit. There we go. This turns into x minus 2 times x plus 1. And this little piece factored into 3x plus 1 times 2x minus 1. So there's this wonderful correspondence between roots and binomials and factors of your polynomial. But we've got everything we want now. We've got it factored. We, we know where its roots are. 2, negative 1, negative 1 third, and 1 half. So you've got its factorization and its roots. That's pretty much everything I could ask for. How are we looking on 40? Courtney? Uh, you, you know, it occurred to me as we were doing this that I didn't necessarily need to pause right here and say, okay, well, we got this, and then we look back and then factor it that way. But sometimes, in fact, I think coming up later today, you're going to be working with this stuff, and when you get down to here, you're going to get a quadratic that won't factor. You're going to have to know what to do with that. And what to do with that would be to use the quadratic formula to figure out where it's actually equal to zero at that point. So it's not bad practice to look at this and pause right here and reflect what's going on here. But if you can factor this, hey, go ahead, factor it. You don't get extra credit for using the quadratic formula when you can factor. So. You know, uh, seven, maybe seven points on an exam, seven or eight. I don't know, it depends. This one's not too bad because, look, you can get all these roots by just looking at your, your calculator, right? I mean, you really didn't have to do... What's that? Yeah, you want to see some work. Yeah, I'm going to want to see some work. Um, I don't know as though you'd get one just like this because all these roots, I mean, you can see them. You can just read them off, all right? What I, what I tend to do is I tend to ask problems like this in little steps. So... One of the things I could ask, in fact, one of the things I do ask is for you to use the rational root theorem. And that would be a problem in and of itself. So your answer to the rational root theorem is this part right here. These are all your possible rational roots. Did I mention not to forget the plus or minus? Yes, I did. All right, good deal. Um, so that would be one part. Uh, another part would be, you know, finding the actual roots. And that's not too bad because you can just look at your graphing calculator and say, all right, well, I don't need to look at all of these. Gee, it looks like there's one at, um, you know, a 1 or a negative 1 or a 2 or negative 2. And it, it's pretty easy um, because you can just look at the graphs. There's actually stuff in this course that I don't teach anymore because you have this wonderful technology of your graphing calculator right in your hand. And there's no point to to learning certain certain rules. Um like the upper bound theorem and the lower bound theorem it used to be a big thing because we didn't, we didn't have graphic calculators and you wanted to eliminate all these things. You used to have to check, keep on checking these by hand in synthetic division until you found one. Yeah, it was pain. Now you just go right to the, okay, no, I know where it's at. <laughs> I'm not going to waste time. Okay, uh, let's try some more. Problem 48. Dallas, question on that? Something? You sure? Okay. Well, yeah, you can. You can. Well, you can confirm that they're roots in a couple ways. If you hit the trace key, it puts a cursor on your graph and allows you to move around on the graph, and you can get close to some of the values. You say, well, gee, that's close to uh, a negative one-third. And negative one-third happened to be on my list of possible rational roots. So try it. You can try it in a couple ways. 
you can try it based on the table. And since I've already hit the trace key, I, I can just type in negative 1 divided by 3. And when I put in that x value, I get a y coordinate of 0. So it's a root. And then I, I look at this like, well, that goes right between 0 and 1. So let me guess that 1 half, 1 divided by 2, oh, that's another root. Or 2 is a root. And all of these have a y coordinate of 0. You could also do that with your table. If you hit the second key and then the table key, you know what, somebody mess with this. Let me reset this to ask. Um, you could type in these values. Negative 1 divided by 3. Uh, 2. Negative 1. And uh, what was the last one? Uh, 1 half. There we go. So 0. 0.5. And bam! You're, you're getting zeros all the way. So you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Problem 48. P of x is x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus 2x squared minus 3x plus 2. Well, let's use this one to practice the rational root theorem again. And what you might notice is that you're getting fewer and fewer candidates because I'm hoping you're getting better and better at the, the rational root theorem. You do have to figure out what P and Q are. What's P equal to? Good. P is 2. Or what's Q equal to? 1. So P is really going to be 2 or the factors of 2, and Q is going to be 1 or the factors of 1. P is this set, 1 and 2, and Q is this set of 1. So our list of candidates, plus or minus P over Q, is pretty small. It's 1 over 1 or 2 over 1. Really not a whole lot of choice there if you're going to have a rational root. Well, let's plug that one into our graphing calculator. So x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus 12x squared. You guys know you have a delete key on your calculator, right? So like one of my old graphs had a minus 12x squared. I can just hit the delete key, get rid of that minus 1. Uh, and then let's change that to a minus 3x plus 2. I think we're good. Let me just double check that. Looks like it matches. Now as far as where to graph this, well, I don't know. But we can draw a little bit of an inspiration from this. If this has a rational root, the largest set it's going to be is what? 2. And the smallest it'll be is negative 2. So let's just go a little bit bigger than that. Let's go from negative 3 to 3. So on the x direction, I'll go negative 3 to 3. And the, um, the y direction, I don't know. Do you need some uh, help adjusting the window for your graphing calculator? Do you want some more practice with that? Should we do a little playing around? Okay. Let me remind you that you one of the possibilities you can do, if, you, if you're not sure, it's like, oh, all right, I'll just do zoom zero. Zoom fit will make the calculator adjust the y values that correspond to your x values. Well, and zoom fit doesn't do too good here. The good news for you, though, is that it does give you a little practice on some skills that will help you out for your test. Zoom zero gives me this, and there's a few things wrong with this graph as far as being a good graph. Uh, a lot of this space up here is pretty much wasted. Yeah, I got this over here, but I kind of knew that was going to happen. I need to see what's going on down here a little bit better. 
The other thing is that these tick marks in the Y direction are pretty tightly spaced. So first things first, what controls the tick marks in the Y direction where they're spaced? Does anyone know? Yeah, the scale. So let's go back, and I'm going to make some adjustments here. My graph goes from negative 0.25, we'll call it, to 110. Let's just go down to negative 1 and up to, I don't know, maybe 10. Now your Y scale, let's make that 2. That way I don't have 10 tick marks. Maybe I'll have you know, a reasonable amount. Let's see what that graph looks like. And at least here we can see a little bit more about what's going on. It looks like our graph crosses the x-axis at four places. Now, if these are going to be rational roots, we really don't have too many things to try, right? Looks like it passes through here at what point? Negative two. So you can do a trace and do that. Trace and then negative two, and I get a zero. Where else does it look like I've got a root? I'd say at one. That's all right. So one. Now these other two, if you kind of trace over with the left arrow key, well, it doesn't look like a nice rational root there. And I don't think I'm going to get a rational root over here either. Remember, our choices were one, negative one, two, or negative two. So we've already got the rational roots that we're going to get. So let's factor that out with synthetic division. Let's see, which one do you want to start with? Let's start out with the, the 1. Mm, there we go. Let's zoom out a little bit here for you. So our coefficients are 1, 2, negative 2, negative 3, and 2. Please don't forget to start out with a zero. Add going down, I get a one. Multiply, you still give me a one. Add gives me a three. Multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, and bam. So one was a root. Good. Kind of knew that, but it's nice to see that. Negative 2 was also a root. What coefficient should I put underneath this one? Yeah, you want to use the reduced part here. So 1, 3, 1, negative 2. So see if you can't race me on this one. That was one of the roots. So if you were to list this out, this has all the possible rational roots. There's a root at 1 and 2. And then there's negatives of these. So it could be negative 1 or negative 2. And so, so yeah, I just tested these. I mean, we looked at the graph. And when we looked at the graph, if you trace, say, negative 2, Take a look what happens. If I plug in negative 2 for x, I get 0 for y. Or if I trace 1, plug in 1 for x, I get 0 for y. You can see the same thing off the table values, too. Uh, let me get rid of these here and type in 1 and negative 2. So those are the roots. Uh, I just hit the delete key. So you delete key up here and get rid of the old values that way. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Sure. So typing them in there or tracing and get them. I mean, it works either way. So let's see about rewriting this polynomial then. So p of x can be written as let's see x minus 1 corresponding to our root here and then x plus 2 and then we got this little charming thing that's left x squared plus x minus 1 so I've got the easy two ones this is not going to give me any nice, easy linear factors. It's just going to be kind of ugly. Not much we can do about it. So, Fadi, I want to find the roots of this polynomial, which means finding out where this equals 0. I know where this is 0. That's 0 at x equals 1. And then I know where the other one is 0. It's at x equal negative 2. How do I find where this is 0? So you got something times something times something equals 0. I know where these are 0. Where's that 0? Or how do I find where that's 0? Yeah. Let me tell you in Spanish. C. <laughs> yeah. Some help for Fadi. How do I find where this is actually equal to zero? Quadratic formula, right? So if if you look at it and you're like, ah, I don't know how to factor that, then it's quadratic formula. So that's a, b, and c. One, one, negative one. So x equals the negative of one plus or minus the square root of 1 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 1 all over 2 times 1. Or in other words, negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. So those are your other two solutions. Overall, there's really four solutions. So we have uh, solutions at x equal 1, x equal negative 2, x equal negative 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, and x equal negative 1 minus the square root of 5 over 2. So you have four solutions for your fourth degree polynomial. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I expected you to answer. Yes. Actually, I expected you to say quadratic formulas all I was expecting. Dwayne? Uh, that was one of my original solutions. Well, um, let me check back at our polynomial, but I'm pretty sure it was a negative 2. If you plug in negative 2 for x, you get 0 for y. So that would mean the root's there. Or if you looked at the graph and traced it at negative 2, that's where it's crossing the x-axis is at negative 2. All right. I think that's pretty conclusive. But thank you. Appreciate you checking me. I'm Say again? So basically what you're saying is you really enjoy these problems. Good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to want all. And actually, in the next section, what's going to happen is that these roots aren't necessarily just going to be rational anymore. They could be complex. So, ooh, yeah. Then it really, then the fun stuff really begins. So, all right. Anything else on problem number 48? No? It's, it's good stuff.
Okay. Your turn for one. Pile number 82. So, P of X is 2X to the 4th plus 15X cubed plus 31X squared plus 20X plus 4. Wow. The mother of all polynomials. Let me see if I've got this one graphed. I'll read it off to you again in case you haven't caught up to it. 2x to the 4th plus 15x cubed plus 31x squared plus 20x plus 4. I'm not sure if I have this program done to this or not. I think I do. I think I do. Let's see. Let's shut this one off. Yeah. Problem number 82. So, bam. Okay, so looking at this and thinking back to my original polynomial, this isn't really a good viewing window. Because what do I expect from a polynomial like this? I've got a positive leading coefficient and an even degree. So what kind of behavior do you expect from the tails? Either the, the tails have to behave together, right? They both go up or they both go down. But the way I've got this graphed, this looks like a, a cubic polynomial, right? Because one's going up and one's going down. But I also noticed something else. I don't think I have the number, the correct number of solutions. So what that's telling me is i got to zoom out. And when I zoom out enough, I'm like, oh, okay, there we go. Now I got it. There's one, there's one. And yeah, something crazy is going on here. It looks like there's a bounce here, but it's not. If you actually were to zoom in on this, there's really a couple solutions. Wow, we have to, or is it a bounce? No, it's not a bounce. There we go. It's a straight through and a straight through. It just happens that those are both very, very close to each other. So we'll have to keep that in mind as we're looking for our possible rational roots. Oh, that, that was really zoomed in. So uh, let me kind of zoom out a little bit. And just look at it here. So, do you want to go through the rational root theorem one more time? Yes, no? Are we good at the rational root theorem? Okay. Got to vote for in favor. So, um, I would, well, for something like this, that's a good question. How picky I am with the windows. Um, you know, this one's a challenging one. I wouldn't give you one just like this. But here's what I'd want to see. I want to see the roots. Um, but I also want to see the minimums and maximums. So you've got a, a local max here, local min here. And then there's actually a local min and then the two roots. So there's a lot going on on that little piece right there. I wouldn't give you something quite so crowded. But you might have to adjust things in the y direction or the x direction to get a good graph. So there's a lot going on here at that little point that's a little bit too crowded for my liking. Coming back here, though, we had a request to deal with the possible rational roots. So you've got p and q. p is going to be one of the factors of this number. So Fadi, what are the factors of 4? Yeah, 1, 2, and 4. And then likewise, the factors of Q are 1 and 2. So my list of plus or minus P over Q, my possible rational roots, would be plus or minus 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 2 over 1. Do I have to list 2 over 2? No, because I've already got the 1 there. And then 4 over 1, do I have to list 4 over 2? No, because I've already got that, that's 2. Writing this in order, in kind of nice increasing order, that's 1 half, 1, 2, and 4. 
So if this, cross, if this graph crosses the x-axis at a rational root, it has to be one of those really eight possibilities, right? Because you got the positive or the negative. So, Fadi, that's your rational root theorem right here. These are your possible rational roots. Let's see which ones we actually think they are. Want me to do this on the graphing calculator or decimals? Calculator? All right. Calculator spoke up first. Let's shut that one off. And as far as the graph is concerned, um, let's see. Negative 3 to 3, I think that still works. Let's just go from negative 15 to 10 on the y-axis. I'm going to put y scale as 5. And I'm not sure if that's going to be tall enough or not. We'll find out. Uh oh i got to put the equal sign on there. There we go. All right. That looks pretty good. If I wanted to be critical of my graph, the right half of this is pretty much wasted space. So let me go back and make x max, say, 0.5. And I don't need to go down quite so far, so maybe negative 8 to positive uh, I'll keep it symmetric, positive 8. Might give me a little bit better window on the x-axis. So there you go. Still going to be really tough to try and get the, the roots, the minimums, the maximums. But, yeah. Oh, you know what? We left off one, didn't we? Yeah. I left off negative 4. I should actually go down to negative 5 on the x-axis. Son of a gun. Yeah, there we go. All right, I'm not going to try and get a window that shows the minimum here. You can. You probably have to go down a little ways farther. But let's work on finding the roots. So it looks like I have a root at negative 2. Let's, let's check that. Trace at negative 2, negative 2 and 0. That one works. And where else might we have a root? Negative one half. Okay. So negative point five and zero. So those are our two roots that we're going to start with. Notice both of those numbers are numbers that are on this list. So your mission, and I'm going to pause things from here. Your mission is to find those or use those two roots to reduce your polynomial and then use a quadratic formula for the rest of it. So it's going to be just like our previous one, problem number 48. We're going to use synthetic division twice to get rid of these factors. It will leave you with a quadratic polynomial. We're going to use the quadratic formula from there to finish solving. Here's your polynomial, and work through it from there.
comes time to factoring this and working with the quadratic formula, I factor out the two before um, before you use the quadratic formula because your two x squared plus ten x plus fourteen term has a factor of two, and it's just a lot easier to deal with if you factor it out first as opposed to factoring it out second. time to work on this, but we just don't have it, so it's all right. So you can watch it in slow-mo at home. It's all right. We've got a few more things to cover in the next section, so here we go. So we discovered by looking at our polynomial and the rational root theorem that it had roots at negative 2 and negative 1 half. So you run through synthetic division with both of those. I did negative 2 first because I don't like fractions, and at least I gave myself a smaller one to work with in terms of the fractions. These numbers here came up here. Did synthetic division again. I get zero in both of these. If I didn't, there'd be a problem. If I didn't, then that means that these aren't roots. So I got a factor here, here, and here. That turns into x plus 2, x plus 1 half, and 2 times this. Now, before I go charging ahead and using the quadratic formula to figure out well, where this is zero, notice that there's a factor of two that I can factor out. So if I factor out that two and then set this equal to zero, well, that two can multiply this here and get rid of the fraction there. That's not a bad thing to do. 2x. And now I'm left with the quadratic formula for this term right here. If you use a quadratic formula for that, there's your a, b, and c. You end up with negative 5 plus or minus the square root of 17 over 2. So overall, your solutions would be x equal negative 2, x equal negative 1 half, and then x is negative 5 plus the square root of 17 over 2, and negative 5 minus the square root of 17 over 2. You can use the plus or minus here. That's fine. i got no issues with that. You can actually factor it. Now that you found these two, you can factor this all the way, completely, using these irrational numbers. It's kind of ugly. I don't do it very often, but you can. This, by the way, shows you why we don't factor stuff like this. We just use the quadratic formula. For homework, try 15 through 23, 29 through 39, 45 through 59, and 69. 81 through 86, try evens and the odds.